what you're talking about is that doing that and having access to that is empowering the department heads to get the information, analyze it, and then put it in a format to executive management. Is that a, a good summary there? Absolutely. I mean, I think you're talking about the sort of top end of all of this work where you're actually the the internal collaboration efforts are generating insights about the business that can then be leveraged by the executive decision making level of the organization to say, hey, we have to get out of this jurisdiction from a supply risk perspective. And we got to pivot to either nearshoring, reshoring, friendshoring, whatever uh alternative approach that we that we want to take but it's not as easy as just saying we want to do that there's a lot of analytics and synthesis that has to happen to enable those strategic decisions to be made and so that's really what what I'm trying to get to ground with in terms of how we design our solutions at Descartes is we recognize that the slickest software in the world is useless if it's not leveraging the most accurate and up to date global trade information, but it's just as accurate to say all of that incredible data, as timely and as as up-to-date as it might be, is really not helpful if there aren't ways to effectively leverage it, right? And so that's what we talk about global trade intelligence being the synthesis of this complete, accurate, and up-to-date data ecosystem with cutting-edge technology that's able to effectively leverage that content. Then customers where a big ERP implementation has fallen flat or a CRM implementation has fallen flat in that the expectations of the organization was the software is going to solve all our problems. And that's just not how it works. The people in your organization are going to solve your problems, but they need tools to do it effectively and efficiently. And that's where really strong technology is a game changer. It's not replacing people and it's not supplanting people. It's extending and enabling the capabilities that your people have because it's giving them, as we talked about, it's giving them access to the right data and the ability to leverage that data effectively to make the best possible compliance decisions they can for their business. I like the way people are saying these days and they're saying use software and technology as your co-pilot you know because there's they're running or they're running side by side with you they're they're your co-pilot they're not the they're not the captain of the ship or anything because you know you, you cannot let it be you know so anyway that that was just the other point yeah whereas before they were so busy trying to classify new parts trying to handle exceptions trying to deal and process transactions that the automation is taken care of. Now they're able to you know, move forward with uh, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for. Uh, it, it, it Putting the expertise where it needs to be. Would that be good as far as that? Absolutely. And it helps to transition. And we talked about this in one of our previous conversations about how much the Russia Ukraine conflict elevated the perception of compliance organizations within, in these international uh, businesses, right? So, for the longest time, compliance has been seen as a headwind to the business. I have a, a former colleague who ran trade compliance at a very large international manufacturer. And he said, my team and I were always referred to as the sales prevention team, right? Because all we ever did was, was tell the commercial folks what they couldn't do, right? Oh, we've got this $50 million deal. Uh, sorry, we can't do business in that jurisdiction, right? And so it was always the perception has frequently been of compliance being that friction point of telling us what we can't do. Let's take advantage of the fact that we've had this moment in the sun where organizations are recognizing the strategic value that compliance can offer. And let's make sure we're building on that opportunity. And the only way we can do that is to start. And I agree with you, Andy, we don't want to talk about these things as mundane or sort of low value tasks, they're critically important, but technology has evolved to the point where let's let the tech handle some of those operational requirements, those transactional requirements, so that we are able to add more strategic value to the organization. Now you can use a tool to, and again, I'm biased here, so I'm going to say like the Descartes tool that allows you to say, okay, let's look at this jurisdiction, let's look at this supplier in more detail. 
right? Are there going to be landed costs or other financial considerations if we switch from this jurisdiction to this other jurisdiction? Can we even do business in this jurisdiction? What about that supplier? So how are we going to do a repeatable workflow that allows us to go from identifying that alternative supplier or that alternative market, look at it from a financial perspective, and also then look at it from a compliance perspective. Well, you got two scenarios that's probably going to happen is that one, the sources of goods coming out of Taiwan is going to be cut off. Well, the U.S. then in, in retaliation is going to cut off, uh, you know, supply out of China. So there's two major sources right there. Are you prepared for that? And what are your other sources? And, and doing when it, when the proverbial, you know, what hits the fan is a little too late to try and do strategic, uh, so, uh, um, planning. You're into crisis management at that point. So this is a way to become more, you know, intuitive and, in, in looking outside that realm. Well, the other scenario here is look at what else is, you know, there are some products that come out of Israel. And the Israel-Palestinian situation and all that is disrupted right now. Is it, you know, supply still coming on or it's minimized? Same thing with Ukraine and Russia and, and all of that. So when you're doing your supply chain or your strategic planning, excuse me, this is one of those that a collaborative effort is paramount. And second to that is getting the right information that would empower you to be able to stay focused. Absolutely. Uh Absolutely spot on, Andy. The one thing that I would add to that, because I've seen a lot of organizations make this mistake when they start to get into the scenario planning and twinning supply chains and having, you know, all of these sort of options on the table is if you don't start from an accurate baseline, all of the scenarios that you plan for could be for naught. What would you recommend, Jackson, if somebody's listening to this going, you know what? I want to follow up on this to at least investigate, you know, what I should, could be able to do, how much it may cost me, whatever the case is. What would be the actions that you would recommend for somebody in this realm to say, Hey, you know, we need to talk about this, or whatever, or uh, take action. As much as I would love to say, call us at Descartes and we've got some great technology that we'll sell you. Like it starts with the internal discussions around, do we understand? where we're exposed from a regulatory perspective? Do we understand where we're exposed from a reputational perspective and from a resiliency perspective? Do we have the executive support and do we have the internal alignment to bring the different disciplines and the different stakeholders in our business together to try to tackle these challenges? Because as we've talked about, it's not just gonna be one team or one individual who has to solve these types of challenges. It's going to be a multi-actor approach. It's going to take everybody. It's going to take different data. It's going to take different expertise.